Do you know, I get into arguments with people on a near daily basis about nationalism because I'm an Irish Republican, which relies on a certain amount of nationalism. And apparently, nationalism is always a very, very bad and bold, backward and reactionary thing. But is nationalism always so terrible and regressive? Is it conversely a perfect panacea of progressivism? Or does it differ depending on the context in which it's used? Is there a difference between the nationalism of the rich in imperial countries like the UK and the US? and the nationalism of the working class in colonised countries fighting for freedom and self-determination. Right, before we can talk about nationalism, we need to know exactly what it is that we're talking about. What is a nation? A lot of people on the left in particular struggle with this question because they're attached to idealist notions of no borders, no nations. And despite genuinely good intentions, that can have disastrous consequences for nations of people that are oppressed, exploited and under attack from imperialism. Like, say, the Palestinians or indigenous groups in the Americas. So let's look at the historical definition of the term. A nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. That's it, that's all there is to it. Note that it's not necessarily a country, though some kind of common territory is a part of it. Also note that race is nowhere mentioned. Now that we know what a nation is, we can move on to a proper understanding of nationalism. People often create a dichotomy between, on one hand, nationalism, which at its most basic level is just supporting the interests of a particular nation, and on the other, internationalism, supporting the interests of nations working together cooperatively. They contrast the two, pigeonholing people into one or the other. However, in many contexts, nationalism is a prerequisite for internationalism. When you've had your homes, your culture, your language, your art, your music, everything that you've held dear, systematically destroyed for decades or centuries, such as in the case of the Irish nation and many others under British colonialism, you're not yet in a strong enough position to fully extend the hand of internationalist support, even if you want to. This is where nationalism can help to strengthen a downtrodden people against the forces of imperialism. Frederick Engels fully understood this in 1882 when he wrote that an international movement of the proletariat or working class is possible only among independent nations. I hold the view that there are two nations in Europe which do not only have the right but the duty to be nationalistic before they become internationalists, the Irish and the Poles. They are internationalists of the best kind if they are very nationalistic. We can, of course, extend that beyond the boundaries of Europe to all countries around the globe that are under the boot of imperialism. And this was well understood in China in the 1930s too, when they knew that they would need both nationalism and internationalism if their liberation struggle was to be successful. We are at once internationalists and patriots, and our slogan is, fight to defend the motherland against aggressors. For only by fighting in defense of the motherland can we defeat the aggressors and achieve national liberation. And only by achieving national liberation will it be possible for the proletariat and other working people to achieve their own emancipation. Similar ideas were expressed by others all over the world fighting for the liberation of oppressed nations, such as Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Cong in Vietnam, as well as Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party in the USA. Now, I've been fairly positive about nationalism so far, but we also need to ensure that we always examine the class character of nationalisms. The nationalisms described so far have been working class or proletarian nationalism. Proletarian nationalism, particularly in the context of a colonised country under the boot of imperialism, is generally a positive, progressive force. It understands the position of the global working class against the global ruling class, or bourgeoisie. Examples of this can be seen in the solidarity expressed between the Irish Republican movement and the Palestinian liberation movement. We understand that this is one struggle against imperialism, and so international solidarity is a key component to the nationalism of oppressed nations. That being said, there is also a ruling class or bourgeois nationalism that can rear its head even in colonised countries. This is a narrow nationalism that seeks to obscure class divisions in a society, instead encouraging rich and poor to unite around a shared national identity. Of course, this is completely incorrect and only serves the interests of the rich and powerful. The working classes of oppressed nations all over the world have far more in common with each other than they do with their national ruling classes. The socio-economic interests of, for example, the Irish proletariat and the Irish bourgeoisie are diametrically opposed, but the bourgeois nationalists deceitfully try to hide that reality and rally us behind their own interests. If you're from an imperialist country like the US, the UK or France in particular, then this chauvinistic, narrow, bourgeois nationalism which seeks to support one nation at the expense of all others 
is probably the first thing that you think of when you hear the word nationalism, which is why many people in imperial core countries will jump to the conclusion that all nationalism is bad. Which, as we've seen, it's not. We just need to make sure that our nationalism is always nested within a clear, consistent, concrete, class-based analysis. James Connolly knew this only too well when he wrote in 1897 that If you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organisation of a socialist republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. England would still rule you to your ruin, even while your lips offered hypocritical homage to the shrine of that freedom whose cause you had betrayed. Nationalism without socialism, without a reorganisation of society on the basis of a broader and more developed form of that common property which underlay the social structure of ancient Erin, is only national recreancy. Connolly knew that the true liberation of our people could only be realised in the establishment of a 32 county socialist republic of Ireland, and that this would be best achieved through a synthesis of socialism and proletarian nationalism. That is to say, socialist republicanism, the application of Marxism and Leninism to the Irish context. For more on that topic, there's a full video on Irish socialist republicanism on this channel that you can have a look at if you're curious. Hopefully this video has helped to clarify the different possible class characters of nationalism which will ultimately determine whether or not they're helpful for the international proletarian liberation struggle. Thanks for watching this video, thanks especially to Michaela Schmid, Rare Hero, William Leach, Luke Noken, and the rest of my patrons. If you have a dollar or two to spare per month, please consider donating on Patreon to help support this work. If you're not in a position to do that, then please like, subscribe, hit the bell notification button, and share these videos around. Cheers everyone, Slong Fowl.